welcome to North Point. There's been a lot of excitement around here, and that excitement, that excitement continues today as we begin the process of appointing deacons. That's a really big deal. I've been looking forward to that. And I would say to the men here, if you are qualified to serve, then I hope you'll answer that call with the same resolve that Isaiah the prophet had in Isaiah 6, verse 8. When God asked, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Isaiah readily replied, here I am, send me. I think we've got several guys qualified, probably more than ten. And men, as you listen today and as you consider the qualifications, boy, if you're qualified, I hope you'll step up and answer that call accordingly. But before we get into that, I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge the great news on Friday. Not only historical for our country, but this is not a political issue to us. This is a moral issue. Not politics. This is a matter of standing where God stands, upholding the truth of his word. And so, for a long time, ever since 1973, Christians have been praying for an end to this barbaric practice and our prayers have been answered. I have to admit, I'm shocked. I thought this country was too far gone. But um, hopefully we've been pulled back from the brink a little bit. God has been merciful to us. Do you understand that since 1973, nearly 64 million babies have been killed by abortion? 64 million and the Bible says that God knows those children and loves those children even in the earliest stages of development. The Bible also says that God hates hands that shed innocent blood. And, and I know there are some catchy words that people try to use to define the abortion issue like choice or rights or freedom. The one word that really describes abortion is murder. And I know that's politically incorrect, but it's the snuffing out of an innocent baby's life. And not even the abortionists deny that. You see people sometimes who argue that it's not a baby, we're not taking a life. Did you know abortionists don't argue that? For instance, William F. Harrison was a very famous abortionist. He lived in Fayetteville, Arkansas. He performed countless abortions and bragged about it. Well, Dr. Harrison said, quote, I am destroying life. No one, neither the patient receiving an abortion nor the person doing the abortion, is ever at any time unaware that they are ending a life. Notice the candor in those words destroying life, ending a life. And so I just want to give God all the praise and all the glory. You cannot be a Christian and support the murder of helpless babies. You just can't. And uh, the fact that God has, has blessed us in this way is, is truly remarkable. Let's pray. Father in heaven, almighty God, we are so thankful for all that you are and all that you do. Father, we know that righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Father, thank you for bringing us back at least a little bit from the brink. We're thankful that babies' lives will be saved. And we pray, Father, that the truth of your word will shine bright in the darkness. So many people, especially young people, are being deceived. They're being misled, and Father, we just pray that the truth will prevail as always. Thank you for this decision. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As I said, today we're talking about deacons, special servants of the church. And that's what a deacon is. If you're here today and you're one of the men considering this office, I want you to understand right up front that you're not just gaining a title or acquiring an office, you are volunteering for service. 
you are saying, here am I, send me. I want to serve. That's what the Greek word for deacon means. Diagonus is the Greek word, and it means servant. The word means servant, or helper, or minister, or assistant. It denotes one who carries out the commands of another. Sometimes in the Bible it's used in a secular sense, like in John 2, verse 5. In that chapter, Jesus and his mother Mary are at a wedding reception. When Mary runs up to Jesus in a panic, she says, they've run out of wine. Jesus said, well, what's that got to do with me? She didn't know what Jesus would do, but she knew Jesus would do something. And so she turns to the servants and says, whatever he tells you to do, you do it. Well, here we're talking about servants, slaves. We might say waiters. And yet that's that same Greek word. They were servants at a wedding feast. When you talk about the church, sometimes it's used in a general sense. In Romans 16, verse 1, Phoebe is said to be a servant of the church at Centria. She was just a hard-working member. She was a servant of that congregation. And then there are times when the word is used in a special sense. We might say in a technical sense. We'll see that in Philippians 1.1 and 1 Timothy 3.8. When it's used this way, it's used for certain officers in the church. These are men who meet and maintain specific qualifications. They are recognized by the church as its special servants. And so guys, I would say to you today, as we begin this process, examine your heart. That's really what it boils down to. It's a heart issue. Anytime God has called men to leadership roles or to assist his people, God has always looked to the heart of the man. Not to his looks, not to his popularity, not to his talent level. God looks to the heart of man. For instance, consider Abraham. Abraham was a great leader of God's people. Well, why did God choose Abraham? Nehemiah 9 verse 8 says, because God found his heart faithful. That's why. When Samuel was told to find Saul's replacement as king, what did God remind him of? He said, Samuel, now you remember, man looks on the outward appearance, but I look on a man's heart. And Jehoshaphat found favor with God. Why? 2 Chronicles 19.3 says, Because he set his heart to seek God. Do you see my point? This is a heart issue. Am I willing to serve? Am I willing to take on this position for God? Men, I want you to examine your hearts today. And I hope you have the heart that will step up and say yes. Yes, I'll do this for the Lord. Well, let's look at Philippians 1.1 for a minute. This is an example of the term being used in a technical sense. As Paul began his letter to the Philippians, he wrote, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons. Notice three groups. First, he mentions the saints. The word saint means sanctified or set apart. Did you know that every Christian, according to the Bible, is a saint? Now, I grew up in a religion that said only a select few post-death classify for sainthood. But I was shocked to learn, no, in the Bible, every Christian is called a saint. They have been set apart for God. Well, Paul acknowledges all the saints, but then he acknowledges two groups in particular. Did you notice that? With the overseers and deacons. The overseers tend to the spiritual needs of the flock. They are the superintendents. Sometimes they're referred to as elders or pastors or shepherds. They tend to the spiritual needs. But notice also the deacons. Who are they? They were servants. 
they tend to the, to the physical needs of the church. It's not practical for the elders to do everything. Can you imagine how often they would be distracted, taken away from their main work? God's wisdom is prevailing here when you see this special group of officers. Those who are there to work with and for the elders, to lighten their load and take care of the things that may seem more menial. Well, as you go to Acts chapter 6, there is a great threat potentially damaging the church. I think it's interesting, in the early chapters of Acts, when the church was just getting started, Satan was attacking from without. There was a lot of external persecution. But the church stood its ground and kept growing. Satan then decided to up the ante. Did you know the one thing that will destroy the church quicker than external opposition is internal opposition? Fighting and feuding and fussing from within? Jesus once said, a house divided against itself will not stand. The Kentucky state flag says, united we stand, divided we fall. If Satan can divide us, he can destroy us. And so in Acts chapter 6, the external stuff hasn't worked. The persecution isn't prevailing. So what does Satan do? He tries to tear them apart from the inside. Notice Acts 6 verse 1. Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenist arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. There were rumblings from within. Certain members of the church felt neglected. Now I want you to notice when this happened. When the disciples were increasing in number. They were growing. In fact, they were growing by the thousands. Some scholars estimate that there were nearly 20,000 members by this time. Well, when you have growth you can expect growing pains. They are inevitable. Right before we even got in our building, we have 50 paved, paved parking spots. And when we drew this up two years ago, I thought, for us, that should be plenty. But then we started having baptisms here, even before we were in the building. And maybe a month before we opened the building, I realized 50 spots will not be enough. We're going to have to put in an overflow lot. And so I went to our builder and I said, look, we're going to have to put in this overflow lot. We just don't have a choice. And he said, Aaron, that's a good problem to have. It is a good problem to have, but it's still a problem, right? <laughs> and you're going to have those as you grow, as more and more people come. And so it was at this moment when the number of the disciples was increasing that there were some rumblings. A complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. Complaining is usually condemned in the Bible. Philippians 2 verse 14 says, Do all things without complaining. James 5 verse 9 says, Do not complain against one another. If you're familiar with the Old Testament, that's what got the Israelites in a lot of trouble. They were constantly complaining, grumbling, and mumbling. Usually that's a negative. But there are times when complaints are legitimate. When a sincere issue is being raised. And that was true here. What was the problem? Some of the widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of food. He had a lot of Christians living in Jerusalem. Some had come for, for, for Pentecost not expecting to be converted and to stick around, 
but here they are. And so the church, every day, the church set up tables and fed those who were in need. If you needed a plate, they provided a plate. But one group of widows were being neglected. They were the Hellenist. The Hellenist Jews were Greek-speaking Jews. They had left Palestine. They had embraced themselves in Greek culture. And so they were kind of like the Jews who left home. Meanwhile, the Hebrews were native Jews. They never left home. They did not subscribe to Greek culture. They spoke Aramaic. They would never use a Greek translation of the Bible like the Septuagint. And so they were both Jews. Now they're both Christians. But this group feels slighted. This group feels neglected. And so what do the disciples do? I think it's very noteworthy that the apostles did not turn a blind eye. The apostles did not sweep it under the rug and just hope it goes away. This was a legitimate complaint. And so they took corrective measure. The twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It's not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. The twelve apostles said, look, they make a good point. This is a problem. But this is also a matter of priorities. We're the apostles. We're busy with the spiritual stuff, preaching the word of God. And it would not be prudent for us to turn aside for, from that work for this work. Now let me ask you, was serving tables important? Yes. Serving tables was very important, especially if you're a hungry widow. But it's not more important than saving souls. And so the apostles said, look, here's what we're going to do. We're going to continue to focus on the spiritual stuff, but we do need to solve this problem. And so what you guys need to do is pick out from among yourselves, from within the congregation, seven men who we can appoint to this task. Why seven? Probably a practical number. It is true that sometimes seven is symbolically used as completeness or perfection in God's word. But in this context, it's probably just a practical number. They felt like seven could handle it. And I want you to notice this pattern. It's really important. The apostles said, you select them, we'll appoint them. That's the pattern we're going to follow with deacons. You select them, and then the elders, the overseers, will appoint them. But notice these seven had to meet certain qualifications. They had to be of good repute. They had to be full of the Spirit and full of wisdom. But notice again the priority. We will devote ourselves to prayer into the ministry of the word. Here's how the story concludes. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Permenes, and Nicholas, a pro proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase. And the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. The apostles said, look, we need you to select seven men who we can appoint to this task. That set well with the church. They said, that's a good idea. And they chose seven men. Here's an interesting tidbit. All seven of these men have Greek names. That shows that they were apparently Hellenistic. What group brought the charge? What group brought the complaint? The Hellenists. The Hellenists, the Greek-speaking Jews, said our widows are being neglected. I think there's wisdom in who they selected. Seven men of that group, right? 
They nipped it in the bud. The apostles said this is a legitimate concern. We can't handle it. We've got other stuff. Truthfully, more important stuff. But somebody needs to do this, and these seven men stepped up. Notice the result. Was the result division? No, it was prosperity. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Satan could have used this to divide the church, to cause a schism. But their wisdom prevailed, and what we have here is a great example of servanthood. Let me say this about those seven men. Have you ever noticed the fact that they said yes? You say, well, I mean, it's kind of implied, but think about that for a minute. These seven men didn't say, well, you know, thanks, but no thanks. I'm kind of busy. I got other things to do. Or, you know, serving tables, I think I can do better than that. It's very commendable that these seven men, when asked to put on an apron and serve tables, said, sure. That's not below me. That's not, I can do that. Here I am, send me. There's a great debate. Were these men officially deacons? Doesn't matter. If they weren't, they were at least foreshadowing the work of deacons. But what you have here are men demonstrating servanthood. Alleviating some of the responsibilities so the apostles can focus on what matters most. Today, elders need to focus on what matters most. If men are willing to step up and take some of the other load away, that benefits everybody. Well, let's go to 1 Timothy 3 and look at the qualifications. This is a church office. Deacons. And deacons have to meet certain qualifications that are found in 1 Timothy 3, verses 8 through 13. Now listen. We don't want to be lax with the qualifications. But at the same time, we don't want to be too rigid, too restrictive. In my 20 plus years of preaching, I know there have been times when men were qualified, but because one or two brothers had a qualm or a quibble, they weren't appointed. Some of these qualifications leave room for judgment. You may have a strong conviction that this qualification means this. I may have a strong conviction that the qualification means that. Rather than just letting pride and, and other things creep in, let's let the congregation decide. Let's yield to autonomy. Can an elder have one child or must he have a plurality of children? What if one of his adult children fall away? What if his wife dies? You know, there's a lot of different questions with qualifications. These need to be godly men. They need to demonstrate godly characteristics. But let's not make our standards harder than God's standards. At the end of the day, if these are godly men, God wants them to serve. All right, 1 Timothy 3, verse 8. Deacons, likewise, must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. And let them also be tested first. Then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives, likewise, must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their own households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Let's look at these quickly. Paul said a deacon must be dignified. The word dignified just means well-respected. He should be a person worthy of respect. Not double-tongued, we might say two-faced. Not saying this to one person and that to another. 
somebody who's sincere and not a hypocrite. Not addicted to much wine. That is, he's not to be a drunkard. He's not to overly indulge in alcohol. Not greedy for dishonest gain. This is important because a deacon might be in charge of the money, <laughs> right? He might be in charge of distributing money or food or other resources. What if he starts stealing or extorting people? He can't be greedy for dishonest gain. A deacon must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. The mystery of the faith is the New Testament. He must be able to preach and practice that with a clear conscience, with a conscience that does not accuse him. What's the opposite of a clear conscience? A guilty conscience, right? Basically, he's saying a deacon needs to possess what he professes. A deacon must be tested first. He needs to prove himself. In other words, the members need to know that he truly is a man of faith. That he truly is a godly man. He says their wives must be dignified. Again, worthy of respect. Not slanderers. Some translations say malicious gossips. A deacon's wife can destroy him. An elder's wife can destroy him. A preacher's wife can destroy him. Loose lips sink ships. She's not to be a slanderer or a gossip, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. He says that a deacon must be the husband of one wife. In Greek, it literally reads, a one-woman man. A deacon must be a one-woman man. The idea is one of, is he faithful to his wife? Is he committed to? To his wife. And a deacon must manage his children and his household well. For an elder, the qualifications say he must have believing children. Deacons don't have to have believing children. Maybe their kids are young and haven't gotten to that point yet. They don't have to be Christians, but he has to prove that he can rule his house well. And finally, he says, those who serve well gain a good standing for themselves. That word, good standing, is the idea of being placed on a pedestal. Now, he doesn't place himself on a pedestal, right? That would be prideful and presumptuous. The idea is, because of his service to the church, they place him on a pedestal. They recognize his worth. And then he also gains great confidence, that is assurance, in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Now I want you to look at those today and during this week. And if you're a man considering the office, ask yourself, do I meet these qualifications? Am I dignified? Am I this? Am I that? Or maybe you think there's a member here qualified. Look at the qualifications. Ask yourself, does he meet these qualifications? If he does, then ask him to serve. Well, what do we have in mind here? Sometimes you have officers in name only. That's especially true of deacons. Sometimes they'll appoint men to be deacons, but then the deacons don't do anything. They just kind of sit there. I'm a deacon, what do you do? Mm, not much. If you're a deacon here, prepare to be used. This is just kind of an outline of areas where we need your help. Benevolence, building, I'm talking about the interior maintenance and upkeep of this building. The church grounds, we have about six acres here, it's a lot of land. Maybe you're good with outside work. We're hoping a deacon will take care of that. Outreach, trying to win the lost, trying to reach the community. Education, the training up and equipping of our children. The Bible classes here are so important to us. 
That's not a babysitting session. Our kids are being taught the Word of God. God's Word is being planted in their hearts and in their souls. And we take that really, really seriously. Maybe you can help with the education department. Events, different things we want to do to try to seek and to save the lost. Keeping up with our supplies, our finances, multimedia, security. Maintaining and working the kitchen. Guest relations, the welcome center, greeting visitors, making sure that first-time visitors get letters. There's a lot that goes into the work here. And so if you're a man who might be qualified, ask yourself, where can I fit in? What can I do to help? But if you sign up, prepare to serve. This congregation is blessed with a lot of people, talented people. And as I said, I think there are men here, they may doubt themselves, but we don't doubt you. There are men here who can do this job. So in closing, when God asked Isaiah, who shall I send? Who will go for us? Isaiah readily replied, here I am, send me. Are there men here who are willing to do that with the deaconship? Are you willing to say, here I am, send me? Here's how this will work. We have white cards in the Welcome Center. We ask that you just, if you think a man is qualified, go to that man and ask him, would you consider being a deacon for this church? If he says yes, write his name on that card and give it to one of the elders. We need the cards turned in by next Sunday. So you have a full week to review the qualifications, to ask the man or men you're considering. By next Sunday, all the white cards will be turned in. The elders will then reach out to these men to see if they do desire the office, to make sure nothing's changed. And then the following Sunday, we will present those names to the church. Remember Acts 6? You select them, we'll appoint them. We'll present their names to the church. And if there are no objections, the next week they will be appointed. All right? So get you a white card in the back before services end. Think of a man or men who qualify and just ask them. I think you're qualified. Are you willing to serve? We want to be a New Testament church in every way. Having overseers and deacons is a big part of that. Will you pray with me? Father in heaven, almighty God, again we bow before you so thankful for another Lord's Day, so thankful for all the blessings you bestow upon this church. Father, we're so excited about the possibility of having deacons. Thank you for bringing men our way who do qualify, men who love you and love this work. Father, we just pray that that men will step up and that the work here will only advance, that the borders of the kingdom might increase that we'll continue to grow spiritually and numerically. Father, we're so thankful for every blessing. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. One more word about um, Roe v. Wade. Again, this is not a political issue for us. This is a moral issue. It's a matter of right and wrong. This church is going to stand where God stands. Our members are expected to stand where God stands. If you're not convicted on this issue, the worst thing you can do is just walk out of here and just tune tune me out. Let Let me sit down with you. Let me open the Bible for you. You wouldn't be here if you didn't believe the Bible, right? Well, let me show you what the Bible says about this issue. It's not a gray area. It's not an area where we can agree to disagree. There are a lot of political issues that don't amount to anything. You can believe your way and I'll believe mine. But when it comes to moral issues, uh, those are not debatable. And so if you're not convicted on this important issue, talk to me. I also want you to know that in the Welcome Center, free of charge, I have a book. I wrote about 10 years ago called Silenced Cries. If you'd rather just read that book on your own, it's free. One per family. But if you want a book, Silenced Cries, go to the Welcome Center, 
Just read it. Read it honestly. Read it objectively. Read it with a heart that wants to please God no matter what. All right? So you can come see me or you can take home a book. God bless you. If you're here today and you're not a child of God, we never wrap up without giving you an opportunity to become one. Did you know that all the mistakes, all the embarrassments, all the times when you felt shame and remorse, did you know all of that can be wiped away? When I was a kid, if you messed up, the teacher put your name on the chalkboard. If you messed up again, you got a check. If you messed up too many more times, you're going to be sent to the principal. I was a nearly perfect child, but there were days when I might get my name at a check or two. I'm bordering on the principal's office, and it was so refreshing when 245 rode around, and just before dismissal, my teacher would go and grab her eraser, she'd go up to the board, and she'd erase it. Clean slate. A fresh start. Boy, I messed up today, but it's been wiped away. Your whole life, you've been accumulating check marks. God says, if you come to my son Jesus, I'll wipe them off. They'll be forget, forgotten. Why? Because Jesus died for you. That's why he paid the price for those sins. And if you'll just accept him, I don't care what you've done, they'll be wiped away. So will you come today believing that Jesus is the Christ? But understand that saving faith is an obedient faith. You must repent of your sins, confess your faith in him, and be immersed in water. The power is not in the water, it's in the blood, but we contact the blood when we're baptized. Paul said in Romans 6, 3, Do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ, listen, were baptized into his death? What does that mean? You were baptized into his death. It means you reach the burial point and the resurrection point. You benefit from his death. That's the idea. And so if you're here today and you need to obey the gospel, don't delay. For the sake of your soul, come now as we stand and sing.